quickly. Uh, this is uh, Red Eye City Impression Extension on brought to you by Trent Radio 92.7 CFFFFM. That's four Fs, but let's move into what I want to uh, kind of talk about today. It's uh, the Kanye West and Joe Rogan interview. And I want to talk about it in... Um, I guess maybe a couple of forms. I've made some notes. I listened to it and watched the entirety of it, which was almost three hours. And that's a long time. Um, And there's some things that stuck out, not so much about the content in the sense of what he's doing, how Kanye is running for president or how Rogan was, how he was interviewing, which I thought was, mm, subpar maybe to what he has interviewed before it felt like um that uh, rogan was a little shell-shocked to be honest this is just my impression from it and again i watched the entire thing i just turned it off maybe 15 minutes ago it just seemed like rogan didn't know where to go or handle kanye's um riffs if that's what they're called because that's what kanye would call it and uh, left me a little disappointed in his performance. But overall, um, there was some things that I... Well, there's a lot of things I liked about it. I had never... To give a little bit of a background on my exposure to Kanye, uh, there's really none. You know, I see headlines and highlights in the news, and I I don't even... I couldn't even tell you the name of any songs. I'm sure I've heard them because I listen to rap and I just don't remember people's names and things like that other than some super old school. But I don't really know him or have watched him speak or how he comes up with thought and how he articulates these types of feelings and how he tells a story. And I was really intrigued and interested in um, the way he was going to express these feelings because people have said that he's kind of off the wall a little bit scattered and um, that kind of um, the way he talks and how he jumps around a lot and how he might start off a topic a and instead of going from a to b he's like a c f g h back to b and i'm similar to that and i really felt that the more i listened to him talking the more i realized that there is a style of articulating a story or an emotion that some people probably feel need more color, if we call it that, or more description of the story that they're telling in order to be able to fully have the listener understand where the person who's telling the story is coming from and this is where I fall into trouble but I also like it like I like the way that sometimes I try to paint a picture because I'm trying to paint so much of that picture in order for the listener to understand have a better understanding sorry of kind of what I'm trying to get at and not so much what I'm getting at but also how I got to it and what also kind of um, is part of that whole picture, right? So when I was listening to him, I kind of felt familiar to it. And I was able to keep up and follow his thought patterns fairly easily. And it, I, so I've read some reviews and things like that where people are calling him delusional or people are saying that he's all over the place and he doesn't know how to... Um, how to stay on topic, but he really is staying on topic because he seems like a person. And again, this is essentially just from this interview that I'm going for him. And this is his words, right? So I'm not interpreting something that someone else has said, and then it becomes, I'm using a third party. This is directly from this interview that he had. And he really has a lot going on in his brain But he really, I think, believes that it's important in order to understand him or what he's thinking that there needs to be the whole picture. And there is so much when you think about the whole picture when you're communicating. And one of the biggest things that I started to think about was how if I'm communicating with somebody or anybody in general... How much information does that other person need when you are trying to send a message or tell a story or explain yourself or train or 
become a leader or anything. And if two people who are in, uh, in some sort of communication, and if we take a relationship, like a partner relationship, for an example, how do you, how does communication work when one person might need to tell an entire story that may take a long time when the other person isn't a good listener or isn't able to put all of those pieces together? And for me, this is a problem that I've had in multiple um, scenarios in in my life going way back where there are certain individuals that haven't had the ability to, or maybe the want, I guess, but it seems more like the ability to follow some of the stories and how my brain gets to a certain point. And that could be for good reason, right? It could be because I'm missing stuff within my sentences, but overall it's gets pretty frustrating and to be able to read your crowd or to be able to shift the way that you articulate something is probably a skill that maybe I need to work a little bit better at yet what type of justification to my purpose or who I am in that story that I'm telling is it being good if I am not allowed to say everything you know there's been uh, sorry, I'm I'm getting off on, off track here, so I want to pull it back back to the Kanye and Rogan thing. So, here are some of my notes, or in a little bit of order of throughout the interview. And again, I'm not really going to talk about too much of the specifics of the words that he's saying, more of his way he ties everything together, and how that if people think he's crazy, that just doesn't from this interview, then that doesn't really make a lot of sense because this is a guy and I'm talking I'll be talking mostly Kanye here because Rogan really said nothing he added like zero value actually into that interview and I was and I know I just said this a minute ago but I was I am disappointed in that and I don't know if maybe Rogan was off his game or didn't feel like there was places to interject because I don't know, maybe Rogan was starstruck with Kanye, I don't know, but it just seemed that um, he couldn't keep up. So anyway, right from the beginning, Kanye's multiple thoughts, expressing all his perspectives through his emotions, through his arms, through his storytelling, and one of the things that I noticed is that he continues to be on track and is able to remember the beginning of his stories or his thoughts and was able to tie them back together. So he may have a direct question, like, how are you going to work with the military? Which was near the end, and it was, I was a little... So this is where, in the interview, I kind of got a little bit, well, even more disappointed because this was like at the three hour and 40 minute mark in the interview. Rogan asked him about when you're running for president, what are you going to do about other countries and the military? And it got a little, there was definitely a 180 in the mood of that interview. Kanye went into some silent prayer and worked on things, but he really didn't have, I guess, the answers that... He should have. He was stumped. It seemed like he was stumped at this. And he went into a certain area where he was trying to kind of avoid what he was not knowing the answer. And this is, again, my impression of this, obviously, because this is what I'm talking about. And Rogan wasn't able to jump on that. He just kind of, I don't know, (laughs) what's the word? Kind of just like floated through it without getting himself in any trouble. And I don't know if Rogan's interviewing has shifted a little bit now that he's gone to Spotify or not, and how he was kind of getting into trouble with the staff from Spotify and things that he had said in the past and the way that he perceives the world and people and things like that. But it seems like he may be a little bit less edgy than he was before, but whatever to each his own. And if that's the way he rolls, that's the way he rolls. So good example of kind of the way Kanye gets through stories was just like that, where I just started talking about some other things, spun them all together. And now it's like, at least you kind of get a little bit of more sense of kind of where I'm coming from. If even that now, sometimes Kanye's stories, um, 
you do get a little lost, but if you stick with it, then you should be good. Now, here is where the communication and sticking with somebody, I think, gets tricky. And this is just a side shot from the actual interview. And again, back to my communication type of push for better communication with people is there is no way I know for sure that a majority of the people or a majority of people could get through that interview listening to him without getting frustrated, without having to want to interject and add more or get more clarity or just to try to pull him back into um, the present question. Now, how often does that happen in your own relationship where you may be having a conversation with somebody, a parent, brother, sister, family member, coworker, boss, lover, whatever, where you're unable to fully explain a situation or a thought or was something happened because people are jumping to conclusions and not willing to listen to the final rant because a, maybe it's a, going to take too long maybe some people will forget what they might want to say from the beginning because there's now two or three ideas or thoughts that have come up that you may have to re, re um, respond to and then they become disengaged and things go to shit because one feels like they're not being heard and the other person feels like they are um not being able to speak or sorry, they're feeling like they're maybe being spoken to too much. And I think this is a huge problem that the communication between two people has to be a little bit synergistic, synergistic, sorry, in order for it to work because there's way too much interpretation and kind of stopping of the communication before the actual point and emotion is articulated adequately. So, on to my notes here. He talked about something that triggered me. So, the whole thing about ranting and long stories and all of that, that was a huge thing. Okay, that's next. Ding. He was using a bell. Ding. Next story, kind of, and which was great. So, in this interview, the first two and a half hours was essentially Kanye talking about a bunch of things. And then the last half hour, Rogan was like, I want to ask you some specific questions. You kind of have to put a cap on it, which was kind of a weird thing to say. Um, I would think it, like a little bit insulting and Kanye kind of brought that up. But Kanye started to self-regulate in this interview where Rogan would ask him a question in the last half. He would start to answer the question he would go sideways a little bit and then he would ding himself saying, whoa, you know, ding. Okay, next question. Like, let's just start from scratch. And I thought that was a good strategy. Now I'm moving forward. This is kind of jumping to the end, but I really thought there was some self-awareness there. that I thought was pretty cool because he was able to stop his thought and move on to the next one. Even though he kind of continued to just tie things back together. So anyway, I'm going to jump back to where I was a few minutes ago. So one of the things when they were talking that jumped out to me and I wrote down in my paper was when Kanye said something about memories and imagination and how memories and imagination control our lives. And I thought, hmm, that is interesting. Because this is going to come to a situation that I've had in the last few days 
is that he's right with this. And how much thought do we put into how controlling our memories are and our imagination is? So memories from the past, imagination for the future, and how those memories can shift and shape and change to either support the way that we believe we are or the way that we think we are or how a memory may help us relate to somebody else or at least give us confidence or less confidence in our everyday lives and how much do those memories not just consciously but subconsciously control the future and our imagination I'm going to tell a quick story right now from literally yesterday or the day before in regard to um, some memories that I had had and had forgotten that were now reminded of me. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. That makes me rethink about that time in my life a little bit differently. And I recently got back onto Facebook um, this week, maybe last week. I think it was this week. And I started just friend requesting people from way back. And, you know, you see people from high school and public school. And it's just like, sure, why not? What harm is that going to do? And I click, click, click. And then one of the people, whatever, started a conversation. And we had a conversation. And this is somebody that uh, I dated a little bit in high school. And whatever the conversation got to, oh, yeah, like, what do you remember from high school? And this person's like you ghosted me. This is before ghosting even existed. And I was like, what? Because my memories of that person at that time wasn't, didn't have me ghosting that person or, um, there, what else was there? There was ghosting. And then there was, um, the way that some of the dating went and this person felt, um, a little bit insecure in a sense, they were shy and thought that I was more not shy. And that's why things didn't maybe go forward because there was some sort of a disconnect there. And I was like, whoa, hold on. Like to myself, I'm like, whoa, hold on. Like, did you really ghost this person? And how did that go? And then I thought, and I really couldn't remember because the memories that I had from this situation and this person were different. They were more of like, I this person had an impact on me. This person made me feel good. This person made me feel more confident in myself. And those are kind of the memories that I carried forward about that relationship and remembering who that person was uh, and how they affected my thoughts and my own confidence and um, from being able to hang out with that person for a little bit. So we talked a little bit more. And we we're kind of laughing about it. Not a big deal, obviously. And... Um, we started to talk about insecurities and how her impression of me was that I was a strong person. Meanwhile, my impression of myself as a young person and as a teenager, I felt very insecure. I had a hard time socializing, even though I seemed to have a lot of friends and was able to pursue um, people in a relationship, dating relationship way that I was reasonably successful in being able to start relationships with people that I was attracted to and underneath all of that I had this yearning for loneliness and insecurity that goes back into my public school and I talked about some of those things about that movie date that I was on when I was in like grade four or five in one of the other shows but it made me think about how my memories were shaped to maybe suit the way that I needed them for myself, not so much for the other person. And how that other person's persons, how that other person was affected from our relationship. And I never really thought about that or took that into account because I assumed that they probably were thinking the same things that I was thinking or feeling, but how would they if the events that took place would affect somebody in different ways? 
And this person who I'm talking about hadn't dated very much at the time. I think we were 17 or 18. I had dated a reasonable amount of time. I had a couple of serious girlfriends by that time. And that perspective alone from someone who has dated and crossed over into different groups of friends because of, you know, this person's from a different um, little group of people that hung out together where it was no problem for me to go to her friends, but it was an issue for her to come to my friends because she didn't feel like she belonged in this little circle or whatever circle and how that affected essentially that relationship without me really realizing that that is what was happening. So I started to think about those memories and then how you build upon them. And if you've got memories from when you're a child, and again, I have lots of my brother and my parents and how my dad treated my brother versus how they treated me and how I remember how it was unfair throughout um, forever, probably up till this day, but whatever, and how I focus so much of those thoughts and those negative thoughts on how I grew up as opposed to focusing so much on the good things. And I talked about this with somebody else this week, I think as well. And it was in regard to negative things when you grow up versus positive things when you grow up. And how do you or why do we put so much weight on those negative things that we grow up that stick with us. Actually, I was talking to my daughter about this. This is what we were talking about because she's a little bit older now and I think she's reflecting a little bit back on the past and how she has focused on certain things in her life and how she's trying to focus on other things now. And it's super true because I focused a lot of my attention, especially through my 20s and 30s, on how my dad's relationship with my brother was different than mine in a negative way and how that affected me and how that has started to run my life and how I have become who I am because of the way that he treated them, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, and which was like negative, 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 negative. Meanwhile, I could have taken those years when, sure, there were some things that were not equal between us, yet there were some great things that were happening, I'm sure, with my dad and myself that I could focus more on. And how would that in those memories affect my imagination and me going forward with my confidence as opposed to thinking about the negative and those negative memories and how I roll going forward? Even how do I parent? If I keep thinking about the negative ways my dad was a parent, am I then going to do the opposite for my own kid? Or are some of those negative things that I have in my head and those thoughts so deeply ingrained and so much on the surface of what I'm thinking that then they sometimes take over and then they become habits without me even knowing? And here's where I would say, Thinking about the positive more often then would create more positive as opposed to thinking about the negative, hoping that you do the opposite. And I'm not sure if following or not on this, but to me, the way you think is the way you act and the way you are. If you're thinking negative, your parents were garbage, you then may become a garbage parent then you will be parenting like garbage as opposed to the opposite. What about all of those times where your dad and mom were loving? Now, I know there is trauma and there's exceptions to everything. And that's fine. And I get that. And there are certain things that you would definitely want to remember as a child if they were wrong in order to not do that again. But this is kind of more of an emotion and a feeling like fear that guides you subconsciously into decisions and into, if we're using parenting, into parenting styles that would emulate the emotion, the feelings, the outcomes that you may have had as a kid in you as a parent with your own kids. And I think I want to look a little bit deeper into that because your memories really do control a lot of your lives you go on a date and you when you're younger and you 
get embarrassed or you go try to kiss somebody for the first time and you slobber all over their face or whatever. I could get into different types of things, but we'll stick with that. And then you see that that reaction from the other person. You are going to remember that the next time that you go to make out with somebody. You're going to remember that when you're lying in bed and thinking, how did I screw that up? And you're going to go over and over that, essentially creating a life that is going to have that memory as a staple to the way that you may kiss somebody for the next long time. So how do we then take shittier memories, crappier memories, and turn them either into good memories or eliminate them so that they aren't affecting our lives in a negative way? Now, people would say or could say, I guess, that if a memory of a negative memory you just you know you identified it it's a, a negative memory and okay now you just make it a good one well it's not that easy just like mental illness same thing with my dad when i had, was going through ocd and a tough time he was a shake it off type of guy just shake it off like just get rid of it well no you can't just get rid of it things take work but how do you work on something if you're unaware that there is something that needs to be worked on right so when i go back to this conversation i had with this person a few days ago I think, how would I have known that I was somebody who may be a ghoster, if that's, I don't know if that's the right word for it, um, and was somebody like that, because I didn't really think that I was like that, but I, when she gave me some examples, like, that's textbook ghosting right there, uh, and again, this is when I was 17, yet, if I knew that's what happened, if I knew that's what was going on, or if I remembered that even as an older self, I would be able to reflect and say, this is how I could have done things better and moved forward. However, being unaware of it, I'm not even thinking about it. Now, here's where the next part of the controlling our lives is, where is our imagination. And this kind of is like manifestation, I guess, to some extent, is how much of your imagination will predict or control your life. Now, he was also spinning, this is Kanye, he was spinning these memories and imagination uh, and how they control their lives within the, the frame of time and how time is, um, is spent in memories and in your imagination, right? The, the moment is the moment and then it's gone right? You have a date for one hour and I, you know, I hate using the date all the time, but you go see your grandmother in the hospital for one hour and that's the time you have one hour of time there. Now, the amount of time you spent imagining or planning on what you're going to do when you go see your grandmother for that hour is much greater than that one hour. The time that you spend planning or imagining how your one week vacation would be or your one day wedding would be over the year prior to that wedding takes up way more time than the actual wedding when you have it that day. So how much effort should we be putting in to our time through our imagination and through our memories? Do we just forget? We have to imagine, right? We have to plan. We cl- when People get married, they close their eyes and they see everybody sitting. They see the flowers. They see the beautiful weather. They see themselves with their partner standing at the altar, doing all that stuff, getting a big kiss. They see that dance and they imagine it. Some people imagine their weddings from when they're super, 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 super tiny by playing it out all the time, right? How many times do you hear about that fairy tale wedding that someone has always thought of since they've been a little kid? Well, here you go. Think about how much time was spent imagining that wedding for literally a day. Now that wedding's over, all of that imagining now flips and it turns into memory. And again, that goes indefinite. You will remember that wedding indefinitely. You will remember the way you built up that memory indefinitely. Now, is there a shift at the actual event? So you have an imagination. This is the way you believe your wedding will be or vacation. You have that vacation or wedding and now it's a memory. Is the memory, does it line up with your imagination? Do you force it to line up? 
because your imagination is so strong and what if what if your wedding is not even close to the way that you imagined it and now your memories of your wedding have just turned into this beautiful imagination that you've created over years into a reality how it happened and which totally dismisses your imagination because your imagination was wrong and it didn't happen and now you've got to tell yourself because your memory of that imagination of the memory of the actual wedding didn't line up with your imagination is how strong is my imagination should my imagination be allowed to run free and grand and spectacular just to set up myself for failure if I can't um, turn that imagination into reality because then my memories of all of that will be a um, will be a, a negative. There'll be a disappointment because I wasn't able to live up to my imagination then creating more time you're spending in your head on these memories and on imagination. So to me, I thought that was kind of neat when he talked a little bit about uh, memories and imagination. Now, I've taken it maybe a little step further with a little bit more detail because he kind of just blurted it out saying memories and imagination. That's kind of controls our lives. But I think there's a lot more to the memories and imagination. I'm going to underline this a little bit more because the more I think about it, the more I think it does have an effect in a good and a bad way. You know, it could go the other way. You could have, you could think, oh, I'm going to go to a family reunion and, oh, it's going to be horrible. Like I got to talk to all of my family that I hadn't seen for years and there's so much small talk and, oh, I can just imagine what aunt... Jody or whoever is going to say and how they're going to act and blah, 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 blah. And it, your imagination, instead of taking you into a spectacular situation, takes you into a negative, right? So now you are spending time imagining the worst. Well, how does your body and subconscious feel going into that event or whatever it is? Because you've been imagining the worst. Now, is there room or should we be imagining what should we be imagining, really? Should we be imagining only good things or should we be imagining other things, the negative? Now, some people would say you have to imagine the negative because you have to protect yourself. Hmm. Maybe, I don't know. That's something that maybe I should think about a little bit later, but that doesn't seem like, uh, I get it, I guess, but that's really not, I don't know. I don't think that would be healthy because it's not like positive living, but what happens again on the flip side is if you imagine going to this event, you go to it and it's awesome and you were wrong. Again, you're now conflicted and you have built this argument within yourself with your imagination versus your reality. And here's where I think imagination for some has gone and I think for society in general maybe I'm wrong on this or not but I think people's imaginations have been suppressed enough that they're afraid to imagine grand because of the fear of not being able to succeed and then the pressure or the attitude that people give people that don't succeed because then they feel like they're wrong I don't think people are set up or allowed to be wrong enough or to imagine big and maybe underachieve to their imagination. Yet, some of if you're not, if you set the bar, if your imagination can go to 100 and you set the bar at your imagination at 60 and you're performing your imagination outcomes to a 50, well, that's a pretty good conversion rate. A 50 out of 60 is pretty good. But really, your imagination should be or could be at that 100, so you're performing at the 50 out of 100. Now, here's where I think, and I'm, hopefully you're with me on this, here's where I think this scale of imagination potential, that's a good word maybe, um, you would want to shoot for the 100. Now, you may not convert a 100 type of imagination at a five out of a six type of result like you would a 60 imagination but you would probably 
convert that 100 imagination if you were convicted in that at a 70 or a 75. Well, right there, by imagining at a level of 100, you have now surpassed your entire conversion level and thought level when you were at a 60. So why wouldn't you shoot for 100 and convert at a 75 as opposed to shooting for a 60 and converting at a 50? If you kind of get what I'm saying, I would rather have a 25% less success rate if the result was higher than me succeeding at 100% at a lower target. I would, if we put this into money terms, I would rather make, if there's $100 on the table, I would rather make 75% of that $100 than if there was $60 on the table and I made 100% of that $60. That's probably the easiest way to articulate that in visual form. And the downside to that is, is that, or upside, maybe if you go the other way, is that if you were, had $60 on the table and you converted that at 100% and got that $60, you may then by extension feel stronger and more accomplished and more at ease and more happy because you achieved that target of 100, or sorry, of 60, uh, at a 60, so 100%, where if you only achieved 75 out of 100, you may feel like you didn't do enough and that you're not good enough to be even competing or even trying to achieve that 100, yet you still made 25% more overall, whether that's happiness, accomplishment, money, whatever it is, then you would have if you reached that 100% of $60. And here's where maybe that would, for another analogy, where you may think um, like um, in a dating, right? So if you are dating and you believe somebody is an 8 out of 10, or a 9 out of 10, let's say 9 out of 10, That's we'll, we'll go with that, no, forget it, let's go 10 out of 10. So if you are dating and you know that if there are 6, 7, 8, 9 out of 10s, 10 out of 10s, all in a room, that you can convert and date somebody who is a 6 out of 10, 100% of the time. Now, the 6 out of 10 and 10 out of 10s, this is subjective. Everybody has their own. I'm not even going to get into what each one is because you can use your own brain and you can decide what you think a 10 is and what you think a six is. So if you believe you can get a six out of 10, 100% of the time, if you think you can get an eight out of 10, 75% of the time, and if you can get a 10 out of 10, 20% of the time, what are you gonna go for? Are you going to go for that 10 out of 10 and have it 20% of the time? Or are you going to go for that 6 out of 10 and get it 100% of the time? And here's where I think your past experience, your memories, your imagination, all of these things dictate what level and what ones you go to try and achieve, right? If you are a maybe a little bit insecure and you have memories of rejection from that 10 out of 10, those eight times out of 10 times that you got rejected and never converted those other two, you may fall back to that six out of 10 in order to just succeed and feel like you're not getting rejected, right? Now, here's where this whole other equation kind of comes into the mix as well. I would think is that how does rejection, which again, memories and then imagination, right? You get rejected in the past. You're going to imagine you're getting rejected in the future. You succeed in the past. You're going to imagine you succeed in the past. So do you succeed more often with sixes in order to go succeed with tens? Or do you get rejected with tens? So now you think you're going to get rejected with tens. So you don't go after them. This is this whole, I don't know the answer to this. So it's not like I'm going to sit here and tell you right now, Here's the the answer. All I'm trying, all I'm doing, is listening to you know this Kanye and Rogan interview, and it draws thoughts from my brain and thinking out loud a little bit on some of these things. Now, he was talking about time and how much time the memories and imagination 
take up in your life. I agree 1000%. They take up a ton of time and not only actual time, but extension time because of the way you act towards them. He also talked about, I'm going to kind of move off from that because that's already 40 minutes. Um, He also moved off from, sorry, he used time and how time equaled love and how to use your time for love. Now, love is everything. Hope is everything too. I think, yeah, he, he even mentioned that, which is great. I wrote that down. I've been telling everybody for the longest time that I believe the one thing that is different in humans than the rest of the animal kingdom, and maybe not for sure, but I think it's one of these things that makes us a little different, is that we have hope. We have that hope that the next day things will be better. We have that hope that maybe there'll be a turn of events if things are going wrong, right? And I guess hope is really, you know, hope is kind of a negative because when you are hopeful, it's usually to get better at something. You don't hope to get worse. You don't at an amazing place and hope that things regress, Hope is kind of one of these things that you want to move forward and get better. And it's also, hope is also that there is faith, I guess you could tie in faith with it too, that, I don't know, I don't want, I'm going to leave that one for right now because that's a little bit bigger topic and I don't want to kind of get into that right now. Maybe I should, but I'm not going to. My apologies. Throat seems to be getting holding up right now so it is getting a little dry maybe i need to grab a drink but anyway off topic ding (laughs) i'm gonna move on to the next thing on my sheet because i'm not even gonna get through it all this is the next thing that i wrote down so new topic still we're talking rogan and kanye interview here Kanye talked about jealousy and I talked about jealousy a couple of shows ago and all about it. I don't have it posted just for the protection of other people for now. It will get posted at some point, but I'm leaving it kind of on private for a little bit. Apologize for that. Anyway, he talked about jealousy and he talked about the father competition. This is what I wrote. Father competition with son when son does better. Now, To me, that doesn't make sense. He was talking about how you are kind of like a version of your dad and your, so I'm talking about me as a guy, my dad and my dad's a version of his dad and his mom. And we're just all new versions of each other. Well, if there's new versions, usually a new version is an upgrade. That would be, I would think that's an agreement, right? You have a new version of anything. It should be better than the last one. Well, knowing that, then there shouldn't be any jealousy. There just should be an awareness and a an excitement that there is a new version of you or of something that is better than you. Envy and jealousy and things like that, to me, don't make sense. Yet he was talking about how this... this I wrote down, torn as a man, torn and proud... Of jealousy, the son reminds the father of his failure. So this is what he talked about. He talked about how the father would be torn as a man and jealous because his son, who's doing better than him, reminds the father of the failures that that father was. And then he becomes jealous of his own kid. Now, I, to me, maybe that's what's happening out there. But I disagree with that, like, 1000%. I don't know if I would ever be jealous of my son. I don't know if he means proud because jealousy is extremely dangerous. And jealousy as a whole, I can see the relationships and like I talked about before with partners and being jealous and things like that. I get that. But to be jealous of your own child because they are a better version of you seems to be the opposite of the way that I would feel if that were to be the case. I've got a a son who's 20 and there are things that he does now and ways that he thinks that are far beyond where I was at when I was 20. And there's things that he does that are better than what I do right now to this day. Now, 
there is zero jealousy in that. He could go become anything. There will never be jealousy. So I'm not really sure where he was coming from that and why anybody would be like that. Now, if there is something that I'm missing within this, then please reach out. Now, if you want to reach out, whatever, you can send me an email somehow, figure it out. Um, But to me, this father-son competition really comes down to ego. But how can you have an ego when it's your kid? You've really got to be in a not a good place if you're jealous of the success or the advancement that your own child has compared to you and where you're at or where you were at. Now, I don't have a ton to say about this, but to me, I thought this this was something that when they talked about it, I couldn't come, I couldn't relate to that. Now, I know, sure, there's sports, and, but it's not even jealous. Like, that's, that's, the, I golf, I golf a lot. My dad was an amazing golfer growing up. He destroyed my brother and I for decades. It wasn't until he became much older and he just physically couldn't compete that my brother and I started to beat him. Now, I hit the golf ball really far, farther than he ever could. And to me, there was never a jealousy that my dad had because I hit the golf ball farther than him. It was pride. He was proud that I could crush it. And now his pride came out in different ways and whatever, but he never felt jealous about that. And I think this is something, and maybe this, that's a, that's a terrible story, but to me, it seems impossible to be jealous of my kid when you're proud of your kids. I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of speechless in a sense thinking about this whole term. And I, again, I don't know if I'm missing something here. Like I literally wrote down, Father competition with son when son does better. Dot, dot, dot. Doesn't make sense. And again, this is experience because I'm a father. So this isn't something that I'm imagining. Torn as a man. Torn slash proud. Jealousy. Son reminds father of his failure. So this is, again, notes that I wrote down while I was listening. Makes no sense. So if... There are situations where the father feels jealous of their own son. I think that goes back to their own upbringing and their own insecurities as a human versus the connection that they have as a family unit, as somebody who is part of their family tree of their blood that should really take over everything. Now, jealous of other people. I've talked about this, too. I don't know if there's jealousy or just sure. I look at people's success and I think, wow, that's great. I wish I could have that success, but it's not jealousy in the sense that I am jealous and that would, cause it's a negative. It's more, and I, I know envy is the wrong word too sometimes, but it's like a combination of that. You know what? That would be great if I could do that. But I know that's not who I am. And I know that there is, in, it's in myself and in my day to day if I want to achieve more. Now, am I jealous that someone has the ability to? No, I'm not. Because jealousy is a negative. And why would I want to bring that in? I'm aware of it. I think that's great. Um, I don't know if I'd be proud of them if I don't know them, but sure, I'm proud of anybody that can accomplish the things that they accomplish, especially if it's for the good. But when it comes to your own kid, that's when you can really have pride and you can show that pride in a um, constructive way to your children as opposed to jealousy. If your kid, and let's even go back to when they're young, if your kid feels like you are jealous as a parent, how do you think that's going to affect what they're doing 
as opposed to if they if you felt proud probably a little different now if that relationship between your dad and you or vice versa mom and daughter or daughter mom whatever mix it up any way you want if you feel that they are being proud for their own good and this is where i have a problem with my dad his pride for me was in his self he was using his pride with me when it comes to golf for his own ego right if that makes sense he was proud of me and would talk about me and certain things i would do in order for himself to feel better now that's the wrong angle of pride and that's why when my dad was proud or say things to me about pride i hated it and i didn't like it because i felt he was doing it for selfish reasons for himself not so much for me but if the pride is unself purposeful if that's the right word and i apologize if i'm not using jargon that makes sense but if the pride is just out of love and sincere pride and not for self advancement or purpose then i would think that pride would be beneficial to the development of that child or the kid or older kid even an adult as opposed to especially as opposed to being jealous and how jealousy essentially would create conflict because of that we're not talking about competition right we're not talking about athletic competition brain competition board game competition achievement competition even that there is friendly competition if you're competing with your kids in a negative way that's probably not a good thing either but when we're talking jealousy here versus pride this is a little bit different um let me write this down sorry anyway move on to the next thing ding relationships versus money this is another thing that kanye talked about and this is something that to me um i get it i get that relationships are more important than money i i agree i'm not disagreeing with that but what i would like to throw in there is the perspective where kanye is coming from when he talks about relationships versus money right He's talking about, he's a billionaire. Rogan is a multi-hundred millionaire. These are guys that money is not an option and how money actually can affect relationships in negative ways. Well, the vast, 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 vast majority of people everywhere, and especially people that are listening to this radio show, this Western civilization, whatever, their money is important. And so are relationships. But you do need some sort of foundation of money in order to have relationships that are worth more than money, I think. So when he talked about relationships versus money and how relationships are more important, that is true to a point of who we're talking about and the money that we're talking about, right? He was talking about friend relationships as well, not just partner relationships, but relationships that he could trust but versus having like all the money and to me mm, sure that's cool to listen to a guy who's a billionaire talk about that but he's talking about people relationships that he's had where people have unlimited credit cards where there's no limit well that is not in a league that i am familiar with so to me yes relationships are even more important if you can sustain them without having any monetary value or whatever for sure especially family and all that stuff but mm, there is a nice little mix i think in there as well next thing because i'm running out of time here was energized versus excited um i don't really remember what that was storytelling all over the place uh do we have patience to stay tuned right so like his storytelling this is kind of back to the beginning um is i liked it i don't know if many people could listen to it so i've started to think how do i adjust the way that i'm going to be in order to be able to articulate maybe more effectively in shorter time do i talk quicker do i talk slower or do i just have to accept that you know what not all information will be provided um and hopefully the person can interpret and read between the lines, which is where I think there's a huge disconnect is the reading between the lines. 
I may be reading between the lines and you may be reading between the lines. That doesn't mean we're reading the same thing that is in between those lines. And how do we fill in all of those lines of interpretation accurately and um, not so much accurately, but also synergistically the same the samely we'll use that word how are we going to read between those lines the samely well that would be a good question right you if that's the, that would be a good test if i wrote a story and i wrote the first two sentences the fifth and sixth sentence the eighth and ninth sentence the eleventh and twelfth sentence would you and i fill in those blank sentences the same even though we have all of those other sentences and the story kind of is laid out in a in a flow would you and i write the same sentences in between those sentence in between the written sentences with only having that little bit of information and i would probably say no right there is no way i think that we could be close and it probably should be close, but I don't think if you were to write, if we were to have a story with half of the sentences missing, and if we were to fill in our story in those blank sentences, I don't think the story would be the same at the end of the day. And if you can think about that, maybe, then you've got to think about what stories or what lines in the story are most important or tell the truest story picture of what the story should sound like and probably need to work from those ones first as opposed to using maybe the unimportant parts of the story first you would use the important parts of the story when you're talking to somebody about or trying to articulate a thought before you would use the unimportant stuff but to me Kanye was a type of person and I'm similar to this where all of it's important here is everything that I've got to say and why I'm saying it and how I got to this point and what I'm thinking about. Sorry that it took too long to get all of this out. Hopefully you're still with me, but this is the only way that it makes sense. So I need to say all of it because if I don't say all of it, then it's not really what I'm trying to say. And that is a disservice to the whole story. So why bother? Anyway, that's my 58 minutes this week. Thanks again, everybody at uh, Trent Radio, 92.7 CFFFM in Peterborough, Red Eye City, Impression Extension, Spotify, YouTube, whatever. And uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. All right. Take it easy. Thank you.